Welcome back. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Larry Lanham. Larry is the Director of Information Science and the Vice President of the Corporation for National Research Initiatives, um, better known by many of us as CNRI, where he works with organizations in both the public and private sectors to develop experimental and pilot applications of advanced networking and information management technologies. His current work is focused on CNRI's digital object architecture, which is based on the concept of the digital object, a uniform approach to representing digital information across computing and application environments, both now and into the future. He is responsible for the developing and ongoing evolution of a series of infrastructure components needed to implement the architecture. He currently, handles, he currently manages the handle system, including its use in DOIs from Crossref, Data Site, and other DOI registration agencies, is PI on multiple fund, funded information management projects, and serves as a co-chair of RDA USA. For those of you who may know the term RDA from the library side of things, this is a different RDA. This is the um, Research Data Alliance. And he will talk more about that. It's a very interesting initiative um, working in the area of, of data. So welcome, Larry. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about building infrastructure for managing data. There's three parts to it. First, I'm going to talk about an organization called Research Data Alliance, which is new, new-ish. Um, and I wasn't at the, for the speakers, I wasn't at the dinner last night because I was at an RDA meeting in uh, Troy, New York yesterday. Um, I'm going to talk about building that infrastructure, focusing on uh, one of the working groups which I'm, I'm helping to manage and data type registry. So we'll start with the organization, why it's there, what we hope to accomplish, dive down a little bit further into one of the moving parts of the organization and what we're trying to do with it and then go to the application of that in a couple of different projects. So we have this, there's this notion, uh, understanding, assumption, that there's a lot to be gained from mining all the, all the data that's out there and that's being collected, especially in science. So here I'm not, I don't like the word big data either. I love the notion that it's living in a mansion look, overlooking the Pacific. We, it's Mr. Big, we, um, so we're not talking about collecting customer information. We're talking about the enormous amounts, the fire hose of data that's now coming out of science projects. Uh, I just heard this morning that uh, this institution is part of the home of Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, like many astronomical projects, one that's happened since then and one that's about to happen, every subsequent uh, large project generates a different order of magnitude of data. And we've come, those of you who like the history of computing, we, we've come, we've, we're naturally coming full circle. Uh, those of you who are old enough, I don't know if there's anybody in the room who's old enough, but you know, used to carry piles of cards to the computer because the computer, the computers didn't get up and walk around. They were the size of this room and you brought the data to them Things have moved as time has gone on. Now it's the data that you can't move. It's too big. Doesn't matter how big the networks are, we have a speed of light problem, we have a physics problem. The data is too big. You have to take the computation to the data now. It's a different world. But we have the notion that buried in all that data that we can't in our feeble little minds see is important stuff important stuff about how the world works, how the world should work. Basic science, uh, disease, well-being, correlate this stuff. Uh, make, make, the, make the grid more efficient. Uh, make the airplanes not fall down, that sort of stuff. So there's this notion that the data is there, that the, that the information is there in the data if we can bring it together and understand it. Further, there's an assumption that there's a lot of data that's buried in domains. What an um, uh, Australian friend of mine uh, calls cylinders of excellence. So we have a lot of cylinders of excellence around the world. 
where the data lives, but it doesn't get out and talk to its friends, the other data, because they speak different languages, they're organized in different ways, and so on. But we have the sense that if you break down those silos and combine data from different areas, there's a lot of leverage. There's things to be learned. These are some recent uh, news stories. Delay in sharing research data is costing lives, according to Nature Medicine. Um, astronomers, uh, Alzheimer's, that sort of thing. So there's some evidence of this, and there's a suspicion that there's a lot more to be gained to make sense of, this, of all this scientific data, this fire hose of data, and especially leveraging across domains. And it's global. It's not US, science is a global enterprise. Um, and that's starting to show. So here are things from the US, from India, from Japan, et cetera, Australia. Uh, people trying to get there, understanding that this is the case, and wanting to improve data sharing. This is the origin of the Research Data Alliance, which I'll talk a, a lot more about here in a few, few seconds. So that was, these, these are drivers. I should be paying attention to, what, to this, what the titles of these slides are. This is driver number one for the formation of Research Data Alliance is this notion that sharing will accelerate innovation. And driver number two is that this should be a, to as great an extent as possible, a community effort. This should be from the, from the ground up, although you need some top down we spent, and I was, I helped put this organization together, and we spent a lot of time looking at other models, looking at IETF, looking at W3C, looking at CoData, uh, looking at a lot of international groups and how do they, uh, how do they manage to, to be effective. And there's lessons to be learned uh, from these groups, uh, both positive and negative. It's a difficult challenge. I'm going to talk mostly about technology in this talk because that's what I know and that's what I do. But there's no question that the organizational and social challenges are probably the hardest part of this to solve. The culture of science. Um, uh, the, I, I like part, the, uh, the parts of Johan's talk I like were about incentives and, and how you figure out where, where the money should go and, and, and so on. There's, a, there's strong cultures around science that uh, are difficult to break through. Uh, there's the old saw that science advances one funeral at a time. Maybe you've heard this. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's, a, it's a very strong culture. Academia, a wonderful, wonderful place, but is a little isolated sometimes from the world. All right, so that, that's driver number two. Now I'm going to step back a little bit. So that there's the, we have this notion. We have a notion of how it's supposed to be formed, what might, what might be useful to enable this data sharing, what kind of organization can we put together, what can we do about it, what can we, what's our action item next Monday, what can we do? So this, this goes back now to one of the uh, precursor organizations, which just barely got off the ground, Data Access and Interoperability Task Force that I was associated with, which is a European project, and I was an advisor to that project. And they asked me to, to uh, summarize what was in the way of data sharing. This is, this is a purely logic exercise on my part, with some informed by some experience. So let's assume there's a set of data sets accessed by repositories, uh, accessible through repositories. My definition of repository is the place you go to get the data. The data can be anywhere. So it's dangerous to think of repository as a container but it is the place you go. And we assume these are available on a network. And the question is, what's in the way and what do you have to do to get to that stuff? So logically, the first thing you have to do is you have to find it. You have to know about it. You have to discover it. What are the components of that? Again, this is just logic chopping. Search. You, you look for it. That can include things like metadata registries, 
librarians know about these things, another way of saying catalogs, indexes, et cetera, search by these things. Crawlers, a little more ad hoc, jump from place to place, find stuff because it points to each other. This is a particular problem in data. Data, data, data sets don't cite each other. You have to use some sort of meta level of pointers or catalogs. There, there are groups of people doing that now, trying to form catalogs of, of data sets. They form editorial boards and they look and they think about it. It's a problem that we don't really understand yet how to solve. Citation, which we just heard a lot about, the direct pointers, references. And in the citation, we have to worry about formats. We also have to worry about permissions. I can know about it, but can I get it? Can I see it? Which is different from can I use it? All right. And finally, trust. You have to believe that the citation, the entry in the registry, et cetera, is telling you about something that you want. This is a, one of the problems of, this, of trying to understand, the, of getting a, a grip on, on the world of scientific data is it's, there's a lot of it. And, and there's a lot of different communities, and you don't know everyone in this community. That this where these cylinders of excellence come in. You know you and your friends, and, and you trust them, or you don't, but you know them. You don't know this guy in India. What's his data? Is it a scam, or is it real? Now, if you know what you're after, now you have to get it. That's the second set of problems to solve. So you have to be able to resolve a reference or an identifier to get to the data. You have to know how to get it, which includes protocol registries, bootstrapping in the new protocols to the extent that they're needed. Authentication and authorization, which I'm sure, I'm sure you know about. Who am I? And do I have, once you believe I'm who I, who I am, do I have the, the, your permission to use your stuff? And where are the permissions? This is, this is a problem with data, a problem with everything actually, which is, are the permissions with the data? Or are they in, is the, is the data in a container and the permissions are in the container so that if you move the data or copy it, you lose all that? That's a, that's a current problem. Now, you found it, you've gotten it, now you have to make sense of it. And this is, here's a big difference between journal, between article publishing and data publishing. Pretty much you, you put a, a journal article in front of someone, assuming they understand the language, they understand what they're looking at. They can even distinguish between a journal article and an auto repair manual, because they know what those things are. Give someone a bunch of numbers, they, you need more information. The numbers are not self-explanatory. So here you need more registries, schemas, vocabularies, formats, available services, user side tools. You need a lot of decorative metadata around these data sets, not just to get deep understanding of them, but to make sense of them at all. And we don't have that infrastructure, especially when we go across domains. A lot of this is local knowledge, local lore. I know what my lab does. I know what the lab next door does. I don't know what they're doing in Japan. Trust, again. Who did this? Who owns it? Can I trust these numbers? Can I repeat the numbers? Maybe many of you have probably seen the recent articles, or maybe it's, I'm just looking at them because of what I'm doing, uh, about repeatability of science. And there's some scary things in there that people can't ever repeat the experiments. This is in part due, I believe, to the fact that, not that they were lying, but that there's not sufficiently accurate recording of what they did. And that's, there's, for example, a working group in RDA focused on that. We need to be precise not only about the results, but we need to be precise about how they got there so that you can reproduce those results if you need to, which is part of provenance, data source, processing steps, computing environment. When, when was this done? How was it done? When, when were the in instruments uh, calibrated? What sort of uh, language was used to do this interpretation? Was there a bug we found out about five years later that affected the numbers? That sort of thing. All right, then you get to reuse, which is the goal of all this. So we find the data, 
We can get it. We can understand what it means. Now we want to do something with it. What, is, what does it take to do that? Well, everything that we just said plus permissions. So just because you understand the data uh, doesn't mean that you can, you can reuse it. Uh, you need to be able to validate it, and you need uh, another nice use of reuse anyway, is integrate live data in education and training, something that hasn't really been, been touched in RDA yet. And then we want to repurpose the data. All right. So that's the, the sense of the potential. Those are some technological issues, and I won't address the social and organizational issues because I don't, I'm, I don't do that, I don't study that sort of thing, but they're there and I know they're at least as tough, probably tougher than the technical issues. But you have to get somebody to talk about that next time. Okay, RDA. So RDA, Research Data Alliance, the people who came with the name weren't librarians. Um, global, community-driven organization, it's a little over a year old officially. Most of the, st most of the precursor organizations started in 2011, the t discussion about this, the sense that something had to happen. There was an effort in Europe called DATF, and then there was a, a which was, wanted to do international collaboration, uh, but wasn't envisioning a global organization. Then there was a less developed notion here about developing a global organization coming out of NSF uh, uh, computing infrastructure, cyber infrastructure office, and NIST, two guys, Alan Platecki and uh, Chris Greer, and they wanted to put together a global organization. And the Australians have been, in a smaller domain, very organized with the Australian National Data Service. Um, those three groups came together and decided to build this. There was a, a precursor meeting in Washington at the end of 2012. And the focus, and they came together and decided the name of the thing should be not DATF or Data Web Forum, which were the two names, but Research Data Alliance. And the focus is building social, organizational, and technical infrastructures. And the idea, this is very, we don't know if this is going to work, but the idea is a coordinated global data infrastructure. Some way to be able to really get to the scientific data sets across the world and understand them and reuse them and see the potential in there. So last September, we came up, actually, Microsoft contributed a facilitator, and he made us come up with a vision. So this was the vision. Research and, researchers and innovators openly share data across technologies, disciplines, and countries to address the grand challenges of society. So that's one of the things that got me involved in this. Um, I could retire. But I have the sense that um, they have some really nasty problems to solve. And, and my hope is that there's information. It, this, this organization can do a little bit to help address some of those problems. Um, there's a lot of technology going now towards, you know, whether if I tilt my smartphone, I, I can get the ball in the hole or not. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to move some of that. <laughs> in the direction of trying to solve some other sorts of problems. Entertainment's not our big problem. We've got a lot of entertainment. We need other kinds of stuff now. And we have a mission. This same guy made us come up with a mission statement and even a picture. This is our picture, Bridges. <laughs> we actually, there's, a, there's a, some, one of the guys who works on this has got like 12 pictures of Bridges. It's a great, great set of photographs, but that's the one I choose. Um, we want to build the social and technical bridges. So it's, it's not, this is not a conference, it's not a society, it's intended to be an organization that sets up, that, that, does, that has, has a plan for Monday morning. That working groups produce stuff, agree on how it works. <sighs> Common data, and here are some of, these are some of the things we've been working on. Common data types, which is what I'm gonna talk about. Persistent identifiers, domain focus portals, standards, policies, tools, that, that the idea is to bring data scientists, data curation, librarians, science, computer guys, et cetera, together. Find out what the problems are. Find out what motivates these people and try and crack through these cylinders of excellence. So 
what's the, how does RDA work? This was, it's still, it's a year old, so we're evolving. The notion, the original notion was working groups, and it was defined as 12 to 18 months to not have it be a talking shop. You have to, and the working groups have to be approved. You have to write a little, sort of a proposal, except you're not getting any money. Um, it's even worse, yes, no money. But the, but the hope is that you bring your money with you, that you're funded to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just what he said. So you bring your money with you. That is, you're funded to do. You do you're doing some work anyway, and and we hope that you you have a, some problems to solve, and you bring it to this interdisciplinary group to see if anybody else has that problem, and maybe they can help you solve it, or your solution can get amplified and and be better known. Um, so you put together a working group, and at 18 months you're done. So far, that's what they said. This is a little worrying because I'm the co-chair of the first of these working groups and I'm done next month and I'm not. So we'll have to see what happens then. I'll get an F for my working group. And, uh, but uh, other people immediately came along and said, well, we got, we got stuff we need to talk about, but we don't, we don't have any output. We just need to talk about this for a while and then we'll come up with a working group. Okay, so we said we established interest groups. But working groups, and, and the interest groups will be tracked, and if they don't do anything, we'll kill them. But the, the working groups are, the, are the, the core. The idea is they will produce best practices. The last thing RDA wants to be is a standards body. There are lots of standards bodies. If something comes out of RDA that should be a standard, it can go to a standards body and take five years to become a standard. But that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. We don't want to do that. Uh, so we decided, well, this is where the IETF s serves as a model. We'll produce something called recommendations, RDA recommendations. And they'll be what they are, and if you want to use them, go ahead. Um, the idea is to have these efforts come out, have a pipeline of these things. And they have to have substantive applicability, efforts for which working scientists and researchers can, can say, this, this, th I need this, this is, this is working, I'll, I'll use it. And we'll see if that happens. Shortly. The launch was in Gothenburg, Sweden, eh, last March. We had 240 people, three approved working groups, nine approved interest groups. Second one was in DC at the National, the National at the big hall at National Academies. Uh, six working groups, 17 interest groups, birds of a feather. 380 participants. The last plenary, that third plenary, was last month. These are every six months. In Dublin, almost 500 participants. A growth rate of the working groups that's either good or scary, depending on your perspective. Uh, 22 interest groups, 14 birds of a feather. And this was a nice part, six co-located events. So these, these plenaries are now attracting a large interdisciplinary crowd so we're getting, we're getting uh, UDAT meetings, we're getting data site meetings, we're getting, all, we're getting other sorts of meetings at the same time because these people are coming anyway. So that's a nice, that's a nice side effect. That's probably, that's the, since we don't have any outputs yet, that's been the most successful part of, part of it, plus all the hallway conversations and getting to know people. Plenary four will be in Amsterdam in September. The three funding bodies are, so far, uh, EU, NSF and Australia, and this was EU, US, and the Australians figured no one would come to Sydney, so they joined forces with the Irish and had it in, in Dublin. This one, we're back to the Europeans. The US uh, plenary will be um, next spring, and it'll probably be on the West Coast this time. I'm trying to figure out, this, the, the, it's the number of people that are starting to, to also starting to scare us in terms of, uh, I mean, this is still not a lot, this is not a big conference compared to uh, IETF or ALA, but, but this is within a year. A year after the IETF was founded, the people were still sitting around a table. So the, the, the growth here is, it, it surprised everyone. And it was probably a function of putting together these separate efforts, and then we gotta, we gotta take off. So the, we have a format coming, to those of you, I encourage you, come to Amsterdam, come to it's probably San Diego uh, next spring. So it's uh, a lot of interaction. 
You had people from funding agency, data organizations, stakeholders, librarians. We have working sessions. And we have this neutral meeting place. For example, uh, in Washington, we had the Citation Harmonization Summit, which I believe was a success. I don't know. Are you going to talk about that? No. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, but you were there. I was. OK, so people can ask her. OK, here's, here's the growth. So uh, what I showed on the chart, basically rapid growth. And as of yesterday, this was 1,600 and some from 73 countries. Europe still, Europe, which started earlier, is still a little dominant, but not much. Um, a lot of academia, uh, some government, some private. Question of whether this is an academic organization or should be an academic organization keeps coming up. And here are some of the working groups and interest groups sort of clustered. So this gives you a sense of the, the stuff. Now, this, this is community driven. The funding bodies didn't decide on this. This was you, uh, group people had to come together, write a little you know, one page proposal saying what this working group would be about, what it would produce, and who would use it. And again, no money. So, uh, but we wanted some management of that, some approval process, so that it looked like a coherent set of things. So we have this, there's many ways to cut this. Uh, but you can say there's domain science stuff. So we got uh, agriculture, we got digital history, we got marine materials. We have community stuff. This was a little hard to define. There's a couple of these. Uh, more sort of librarian stuff. This is one that I've recently got involved in. Uh, publishing data, data publishing was the one that you couldn't get in a room because it was so crowded. So that's the that's sort of a, a, a focus of this group. How do you publish data? What does it mean? More of the incentive stuff, like Yohan was talking about. What's the impact of publishing data? Do you get credit for publishing data? So far not. Uh, one of the keynotes was an astronomer. I think actually it was a UDAT conference, but related. An astronomer who talked about this, you know, long project, and nobody wanted to publish the data because they were going to get scooped. You know, they they put all this time into publishing the data. They want they had a, they needed some time to write the articles, but the data was there. Lots of people could have been looking at the data. You know, millions have been invested in collecting the data. It's, it should be a public good, but instead, it's it's restricted to the people who who reasonably need to publish articles out of it because that's their career. So that's, we got to fix that. Um, reference. And then the, the base infrastructure stuff really down low, which is where I am. All right, here's the, here's the organization itself. Um, this is the heart of it, the working groups and the interest groups. These are the guys with the money. Again, there's three of them so far. Uh, they're in dotted line, they're, they're sort of the hands off. Uh, and they have been. Uh, but they were the ones who initially appointed the first half of this group, which is already a council, which would sort of be the board of directors. Now they're, now they're self-selecting. And then here's the, the sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the staff, if you will. So we just appointed a secretary general, and then there's a bunch of... Uh, Secretariat, people put up a website or help organize the meetings, et cetera. It turns out these meetings are very expensive. There's a technical advisory board. They're not supposed to define what happens, but they're supposed to look for gaps, uh, build uh, connections, see who's working with each other, and so on. And then this is most recent. You can be an organizational member. If you want to be an individual member, you just say, yeah, I'm in favor of data sharing. Uh, and you're a member. That's where the 1600 come from. And you can vote. You can vote for this. You can vote for this. So there's something there. Um, you still have to pay to come to the meetings. Organizations have to pay some money, depending on how big they are. And they are supposedly, it's, it remains to be seen, the way in which these will impact each other. I, I've, I've come to regard myself as having gone from doing actual uh, publishing and then development and librarian work 
to managing other people who did that to now being an organizational architect. Seems like I spent the last five years figuring out different organizations. So this one is coming along. This is pretty solid right now, which is to say it's not changing, whether it's the right thing or not. You know, in a year or two, we may blow this up and do something else. All right, now we're going to get into a little bit of the substance. So, so far, why do we need this? How's the organization looking? A little bit of detail on what it's doing. So these are, the, these are the working groups that are supposed to finish soon and produce these recommendations. And we're still having debates about intellectual properties, debates about whether we need to involve the lawyers or not, uh, patents, et cetera. So there's some nasty stuff coming. Uh, we know that because I've seen it in, all, in many other organizations. So the data type registry is working group. That's what we'll talk about more in a minute, because that's what I started. Uh, and there's some people who are going to use it. Practical code policies. This is, this is very badly named. Uh, this is workflow. This is capturing the steps, capturing and precisely recording the steps in science so that it's repeatable. So this is like science log. And what does it mean to have this policy? How does it work? But it goes as far as what, where does the data get replicated? Who owns it, et cetera. So it's, it's recording all the stuff that goes on that normally is just known locally and not recorded. And then try to automate it. This one, persistent identifier information types, is supposed to be, but I think it's going to turn into something else, for better or worse. It was supposed to be this which is if you resolve a persistent identifier, what do you get back as sort of a rec recommended set of things you get back? And uh, Data Conservancy, which is John Hopkins and the, the German Science Center, DKRZ, have said they, they're going to use that. Okay, medium-term goal, three to five years. This is the goal, pipeline, data sharing infrastructure efforts adopted and used by communities. So if we don't do that, we'll either have to find something else that's useful or we'll shut down. I have, I have made the suggestion uh, that so far seems to be considered that RDA give itself a horizon of 10 years. And if it's going to exist after 10 years, that has a very good reason to do so. We've been funded for five in the US. We want to build and expand the research data community and evolve as a useful, relevant, and agile organization. Somewhere in between, I mean, IETF is used as an example. There's good things and bad things about IETF, W3C, IEEE, CoData. We're trying to, I mean, every time you do something new, you get to look at what's happened before you, and you get to try and learn lessons from that. We think there are lessons to be learned from all of those organizations, uh, both when they start and as they age. So it's very hard to keep, thing ad keep an organization agile because paralysis sets in almost immediately, calcification and so on. It's very hard to, not, not to come up with ways to keep that flexible and keep blowing it up every couple of years to make sure it, it's still vital. Okay. One, this is a, this is a slide uh, from a presentation I made to the Sloan Foundation. Uh, the point of which was, if you want to fund, if you want to contribute to the RDA, if you think this is a good idea, we, we got the coffee and donuts money already. We got that. Don't worry about it. What we need is funded research projects in the RDA. And that's already the case, that we can, RDA can serve in the, as an accelerant of existing projects. And it's an interesting one because it involves one, so Sloan funded me to do this, which is a couple of registries, and they funded RPI to do this, which is a huge science infrastructure project. I'm the, I'm the PI on this, the day-to-day -day, uh, straw boss of this, a guy named John Erickson, one of the co-PIs. John and I have known each other for at least 15 years and have worked together in various ways. Skype with each other probably a couple times a month. We worked, we wound up working together on these two projects only after RDA came into effect. 
came into existence. So even though it was two people working on projects funded by Sloan, same, fun, same, same program manager, a guy named Danny Goroff, he knew about them. The two people who were most involved know each other well. We weren't working together because we, 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 did, you know, we sort of knew each of us had a project. But it's only when we came together at these plenaries that we started looking at each other's presentations and talking to each other about this stuff. Then we said, oh, you, can, you have something to contribute to me. I have something to contribute to you. It's a gift again. OK, data types. Now I'm, now I'm going to dive down into, as an example, and I hope an interesting topic for people interested in data, this working group called data types. So what do we mean by that? We want to characterize data structures at multiple levels of granularity. So this is kind of like the types you know. If you're a programmer, you understand uh, primitives. This, this variable is an integer. This is, a, this is a float. This is a matrix. This is an array. And if you, uh, you're a network person, you know about MIME types, you know, or an operating system person, you know that this is, a, this is a Word document. Therefore, I give it over to here, this thing. So those are, those are primitive types and sort of container types. We want to uh, use the same approach for data sets. And it's not that there aren't ways to do that now. There are sort of ways to do that now. And I, there are probably ways I don't know. But they're not easy. And they're, uh, especially, they're not easy to record and register. Anybody recently tried to establish a MIME type? It's not easy. <laughs> it's a lot of over. You can't just say, oh, I got a new MIME type. You, you can't do it. I want to make this easy. And you can think of those as macros or shortcuts for understanding and processing data. This data is of type X. That means something. I understand what it means. I can go somewhere and look at the sort of the documentation. What does the cell in, what does this cell number? If there's an eight in this location, what does it mean? How to get there? So file, no, I've anticipated my next point. So file formats and MIME types are examples, but they don't solve the finer grained thing that I really need to interpret. Remember, I need to interpret the data. I need to understand it. I get, just having it, then it's a string of numbers. It's a bag of bits. I, I need help to understand it. I especially need help 50 years from now. And 50 years from now, that's, that data, maybe the, maybe some social, I don't know. I won't say what data is not important 50 years from now, but it's certainly the case that science data might be more important 50 years from now than it is today. So, and we may need multiple levels of typing, of course. And the point is that this enables humans and machines to discover, process, and reason about data. Because we, remember, there's all this data. You've got to take the processing of the data. There's vast amounts. I can't read it. There's too much of it. We need, we need to develop processes that understand, read, parse, look at. Our brains, our poor little brains are too small. Uh, we can't read fast enough. Uh, the data is mountainous. It needs to be processed automatically. So what are data type registries? Well, we want each of these types registered and uniquely identified. We want a common data model and expression so that you can understand what it means. And we want to associate the data with services, tools, format registries, et cetera. So a focal point for understanding data types and a common API for machine instruction, for machine consumption. This doesn't mean that I think there's going to be one of them. There won't be one. There will be many. Um, and it doesn't mean there'll be type police. There, there shouldn't be type police. If you're using a type, and if the rest of the world thinks you're nuts, say, no, it's just the same as my type. You haven't done anything. It's just, just a different shade of blue. You're, you, it's worth a waste of time. But you're using the type. It should be in one of these registries. Because then people will find your data and they want to know what you meant. Even if people think you're stupid, it's what you meant. So RDA, actually it was going to be in DIITF, and then RDA came along. Let's start a working group as an experiment. Plus we got this money from Sloan. We're working on it already. And I found some guy who was interested in it. So our goal is an interoperable set of type registries. It was approved. 
uh, is an RDA working group at Plenary One, which I now regret because it means I'm supposed to be done soon. Uh, the co-chairs are me and a guy at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, Dan Broder, who I've worked with for a while. That's in uh, Nijmegen, in Holland. Uh, last time I looked, there were 44 members of the working group. Pretty wide uh, spread. And I remember, I'm working on this with me, myself, and the, with myself and a few other people at CNRI, and a few colleagues who sort of know about it, who think they might use it. Now, I got 44 people who are looking at this and commenting on it. That's the idea of amplification. And maybe they'll use it when it's done. I'm getting a lot more bang for my Sloan buck than I, than I would be otherwise. That's why, I, that's why I took it there. And it's different fields. It's, you know, it's science people, it's librarians, it's publishers. This is a schedule. We're probably two months behind. And since we're pioneers in this, I don't know what that means. The organization will have to figure out what to do with me in May because I'm not done yet. And then the, then the question will be, yeah, I'll, I can write a report maybe in September, then what? So at the meeting yesterday of the U.S. Steering Advisory Committee for RDA, we started talking about follow-on groups, maintenance groups, deployment groups, et cetera. So this is all still a work in, work in progress. I still like the 18-month thing. We, we don't want this stuff to run forever. We want, everybody works to deadlines. We need deadlines. Okay, here's some, what would you do with this? So one of them, this is the, this is the guy from Nijmegen, Dan. Broad functional classification. So he wants to type data sets in repositories to make sense of what's available. There's lots of data in repositories. Ob metadata, repository descriptions, contact information, et cetera. He wants broad, broad classification. Second one is simple license information. This came from, the, from Jan Braas, the data site guy. Uh, he wants to uh, access conditions to result from um, DOI resolutions. So, you know, I tend to DOI's handles resolve the triples, handle type values. And he wants one of those to be a broad classification or a pointer to uh, excess conditions, level of indirection, pop up or intervening page. Now, we wouldn't do this. We would define that type, put it in a registry. And then an application builder would look at that type and say, oh, I know what this is. Then this is, this, is, uh, this is the one that came from Deep Carbon Observatory, which no one else thought of. Object types is a shortcut for dependent services. I didn't even know what John was talking about when he said this initially. So think about data acquisition. He's got in Deep Carbon Observatory, which we'll look at in a minute, um, everything is an object. Every object has an identifier. He's talking about researchers, experiments, publications, data sets. Everything is an object. It's a world of objects identified with attributes. So when he's acquiring these things, he wants to say, oh, I'm acquiring a researcher. This is type X. Let me go to this registry and see what my property, required properties are to build something of this sort. So it functions, in effect, as a data acquisition template. And then the, the thing that got me interested in this in the first place, and actually we tried to do it a number of years ago and got no traction, is to um, take the identifier type value triples, where the the type is open. You can you can you can have these triples handles DOI. You can put anything you want in the type field, and as long as you and your friends understand what that means, it's useful to you. But we want that to be more organized, enable complex client interactions. All right. So how long do I have to do this? Is that, do I end at quarter of 12? Really? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> All right, I will show two, two use cases, and then I might be done. Uh, so this is a discovery use case. So I'll assume a, a set of users, assume this federated set of type registries which don't exist yet. 
and assume a bunch of uh, data, which has, let's hope, IDs, types, and the data. So discovery is I look for types that match their criteria. So I want, uh, I want data sets that combine location, temperature, and date timestamp. I'm interested in that for some reason. I got this plan. I'm going to compare this to sunspots or something. All right. So the type registry returns matching types, not data, types, that, because there will probably be seven or eight kinds of this, because you could arrange this data in different ways. And, and remember, there's no type police. So there might be ten of these. And you look into repositories and metadata registries to see if you got if you got data sets that match those types. And then you get them back. Processing, which was the thing I had in mind originally, works much the same way, except you get some data of an unknown type. You go off to the type registries, you understand what it is, you get you bootstrap into this perhaps, or at least you you the human understand it and can put together some little processing routine. Um, and that allows you to either use the data directly or and this, we already have cases where this will happen. In, instead, you, you find out from here that there's services that work on data of this type. So you can send them the identifier and those services will go. And they, they, they obviously will go and do that. So you find data of type X and you realize that you can send it to service Y and get back uh, uh, information of type Z. The, the easy one to imagine is visualization. So I have my mythical uh, time, location, uh, temperature thing, and I know that there's a service over here run by the German Climate Center that will take that and build me a nice graph so I can look at it. And maybe I can take six data sets. That's where we hope things work now. Take six of those kind of data sets, put them together, and get a bigger graph that I couldn't get from my original. And I don't have to have done that. That's the fourth paradigm of science, says I don't have to I don't have to collect the data anymore. I use other people's data. All right, uh, five minutes. I'm going to have to skip Deep Carbon Observatory. <laughs> but this is a world of deep carbon science projects, big funded Sloan thing. All of the entities are objects, and they're all going to be typed and identified, and, and they'll use the type registry to, to help with that data acquisition, figure it out. That's this one. And then finally, I might actually get, all right, and we're working together. I told that story already. Types in the handle system. So typing makes sense of data, which is just bits, right? This has always been the case. Handles resolve the type value pairs. All, all of our functions reside in the applications. All the handle system is idiot savant. It just sends you back. Type value pairs, type value pairs, that's all it does. Applications have to understand what to do with it. Handles identify digital entities, which are implicitly or explicitly typed. Either you know it, you know what kind of data this is that's implicitly typed, or we hope we routinize this, so typing is explicit. So to develop handle app based applications, you have to understand the types of return values. A lot of developers, you get their hands on the handle system immediately do this. They start making up types. I remember an early one was, you know, the London tube system and how it all worked and so on. But he was the only guy who knew what that meant. So we'll at some point need to understand the downstream data identified by handles. And that's that one. Uh, we have a very simple data model, which is evolving as I speak. So I don't know if this is right. But we, we, you know, the idea is not to redo anything, to, but include and point to other stuff. So if these things mean something to you, we're not trying to replace those at all. We wouldn't think of that. Um, and the, the types, the registries will be federated. Users decide what data structures to register or not. But data structure is expected to play a global role. Then users are encouraged to register that data structure so other people can use it, other people can understand it. It's a gift thing. And then, of course, 
if you're going to go through a lot of work to create a, a type, go ahead and look first, we say, and see if there is one. Okay, that's it. Um, yeah, m my question is as follows. Uh, I, I, I think this is fantastic, right? Because I, I work with big data sets all the time, and it's, and it, I mean, the amount of overhead that goes into managing yeah. uh, the data, looking at the, the kind of data that we have received, looking at the, uh, the, the headers, normalizing the, the, the data types, you know, the storage and all that. So I, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the effort. So my question is not intended as a, as a criticism, just out of curiosity, right? In, in, in many processes, you've got garbage in, garbage out, right? Right. So with these kind of registries, how do you prevent the, the problem of garbage in? Because, you know, I, I, let me, I think there's two things that work against these kind of systems, and it's that the scientists themselves have no incentives, one, to make their data available. Yes. Because, right. uh, I mean, to mention just a few, competition, Yes. Uh, to mention, uh, you know, the, the danger of getting getting scooped, uh, the overhead of doing so, let alone the overhead of actually not just making the data available, but making it available in such a way that it's easy to to use. Right. So, in fact, I've received data sets from colleagues where I think that they deliberately screwed up the headers <laughs> many times, just to, just to delay us with right. another four or five Mis months. Misinformation. <laughs> and so. I understand it's better to have a standard than to not have a standard, but it, it seems to me that unless you fix the incentives that are involved Absolute, in sharing data, absolutely. et cetera, that you, you, you remain to have a serious problem. Yes. Is that, that's both questions, or is that two concerns? What you said you had two. Oh, uh, did I say two? I, I meant that one. That one, yes. okay. okay. All right. All right. So, yeah, so in two, two, two and I, but I have two answers. Maybe that's what I was thinking about. Uh, one is, yeah, I remember at the beginning I said that, you know, we're the, I'm one of the screwdriver guys. I'm not one of the social science guys. So that's, RDA is focused on that. Remember, we want credit for data publishing. That's a, that's a huge issue. And we get, you know, NSF is funding this. So they, they don't think this is a stupid idea. They, they like it too. Um, and uh, Sloan is behind this too. They have their own, I mean, that my worry with Sloan is expectations. They said, we really love RDA. We think it's going to solve a lot of our problems. We fund silos all the time. We need to bring these together. This is an example of them doing that, this deep carbon observatory. So they were all funded. These various science projects were funded with the, with the uh, demand that they come together in this system. So, one of the, so they funded science, 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 infrastructure. You use the infrastructure. You use the infrastructure. You use the, or you're not going to give you any more money. Whether they'll stick to that or not remains to be seen. But that's, that's the idea. So this, so this is being kind of jammed down their throats. We also have the OMB stuff, and, and um, OMB came after the uh, OSTP. So in the US, you're being told you have to share whether that'll actually work or not, or whether it'll turn into ADA. Remains to be seen. So those are, you're, you're absolutely right. Anything else? There's time for lunch. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.